So this is the practice quiz on bonding. The first 10 questions, you're just going to choose which of the examples in the question are the correct answer, but you don't get any credit unless you can justify your answer because each one you have a 50% chance of getting correct. So you have to have the proper justification for each of these. So the first question, which substance contains polar covalent bonds. The fact that it says covalent means you have to have a non-metal with a non-metal. And since it's polar, that means it has to be two different non-metals because then they won't be sharing the electrons equally. So it can't be H2, it's got to be H2O. And your reason why can just be two different non-metals. Or if you wanted to get more specific, you could say that the electrons are not being shared equally. All right, next, which substance forms molecules? Molecules, we can only use that term when it's covalent. So the first one, we have a metal and a nonmetal, and the other example, we have two nonmetals. So it can't be this one. So your answer is CH4, and your reason why could just be that it's covalent. Or if you want to get more specific, you can say they're sharing electrons, which makes it a molecule. Number three, which substance does not conduct electricity as a solid, but it does when it's melted? And when we talked about conductivity, we said covalent substances never conduct, metallic substances always conduct, and ionic substances conduct when they are melted or dissolved So we're describing here an ionic substance, so we would say NaCl, and your reasoning why could just be that it's ionic. Number four, which substance is the most ionic in character? So they're really asking which one has the greatest electronegativity difference. It would also have the highest boiling point, it would have the highest melting point, and to figure that out, you have to look up the electronegativities. So we're going to use table S. So I'll pull that in. So here it is. I thought I had a prettier one, but this one will do. We're going to look up the electronegativity first of lithium, which is going to be right here. Lithium's element number three. So it's 1.0. And then oxygen, which is right here, is 3.4. So the difference between those two is 2.4. And then calcium, which is right, this is so small, you guys will probably find it before me, right here it's 1.0, it's element number 20. And then um, chlorine is element number 17, so it's 3.2. I don't even really need to do the math since I can do that in my head, but it's 2.2. So the one with the greatest would be LiO, and your reasoning could say it has the greatest electronegativity difference. All right, moving on to the next one. They're asking which of those is a nonpolar molecule. Since both of them must have polar bonds, since they're two different nonmetals uh, bonded together in each of these, you really have to draw them in order to figure it out. CO2 is one I asked you guys to memorize. So it looks like this. But H2S, you may have to figure that out. S has six valence electrons, which means that it has two unpaired electrons. Hydrogen has just one, so it would look like this. Kind of like water. S is actually in the same group or family as oxygen. So which one of those is nonpolar? Well, nonpolar molecules are symmetrical, which means that the answer is going to be CO2, and you can just say that it is symmetrical. Number six, which substance conducts electricity as a solid and as a liquid? So that means it's conducting electricity all the time. That would be iron. And you can just say it has mobile electrons in order to describe that. Number seven, which substance does not conduct electricity as a solid but does when dissolved in a liquid? So this is not unlike 
question number three. It's again describing something ionic. So looking at our choices, silicon is a metalloid, a semi-metal, but it is on the non-metal side, so that's going to be covalent. KCl is definitely ionic. We have a metal bonded to a non-metal, so it's KCl, and it's because it's ionic. Next one, which substance has polar bonds but is a nonpolar molecule? They're saying that the bonds are polar. That means it's between two different nonmetals, but the molecule itself is nonpolar, meaning it's symmetrical. I can figure this out actually uh, without drawing it because N2 is between two of the same nonmetals, so the bonds are going to be nonpolar and they were looking for something with polar bonds. So we can eliminate N2, but just for fun, let's draw CH4. Remember, carbon will move its electrons in order to make four bonds, so it looks like this. So the bonds themselves are going to be polar because they're between two different nonmetals, but because of the molecule's symmetry, the molecule is going to be nonpolar. So we're going to say CH4, and you're going to say two different nonmetals, but it is symmetrical. And that will justify your answer. All right, one last question on the front. Which substance has metallic bonds, brass or ammonia? Brass, as you recall, is an alloy, which is a mixture of metals. Ammonia is actually a covalently bonded substance, NH3. So we're going to say brass. And we're going to say it's an alloy, or, oop, that should be an O, an alloy. Or if you wanted to, you could get more specific and say it's a mixture of metals. You don't have to say both, but if you think you'll forget that term, alloy, you could just say it's a mixture of metals. All right, last uh, short answer question, which substance has nonpolar bonds? Nonpolar bonds implies that you have two of the same nonmetal. So this would be a diatomic. HF is two different nonmetals, so that won't be the answer. So we're going to say F2, and really what a nonpolar bond implies is that they share equally. So you could say that, or you could say it's two of the same nonmetal. I'm going to say shares equally since I already wrote the other above. So you'll have two choices as to what you could give us your justification. All right, the rest of these are going to be drawing, and you won't know um, because I haven't told you if it's ionic or not. You're going to have to figure that out on your own. This first one, we have a metal and a nonmetal. That is going to be ionic. I would, if I were you, and I won't be grading this, I would go ahead and write that down so you remember you're going to have to draw ions here. So the metal, when you look it up, has two valence electrons. Our nonmetal phosphorus has oops, five valence electrons. The metal is going to lose its valence electrons to become an ion and a positive charge. The nonmetal is going to gain enough to end up with eight valence electrons, which gives it a negative charge. And then you have to resolve the fact that calcium is only losing two, but phosphorus needs to gain three. The lowest common multiple is six, so if I have three calcium ions, I'll have my six electrons to give to two phosphorus ions. Our formula then is Ca3P2, and when we name this, we name the first, leave a space, name the second, changing the ending to IDE, and when you look up calcium, it only has one positive oxidation number, so you're done. Next, we have silicon and fluorine. Both are nonmetals, so this is going to be covalent. Silicon, just like carbon, will move its electrons around so that it can make four bonds. Fluorine has seven. It's a halogen, like so. So fluorine can only make one bond. Silicon can make four, so I'm going to put silicon in the middle. And then a fluorine, and I'm going to switch to dots because it's less work. On each side, like so. All 
And it's mostly a good rule of thumb that the lower electronegative element goes first, and that works this time. And then we're going to name the first, leave a space, name the second, changing the ending to IDE. You're going to see that silicon does have multiple positive oxidation numbers, so we have to figure it out. This isn't an ion. If it had been an ion uh, or an ionically bonded compound, you could just use the charge. In this case, we have to figure it out. Fluorine's minus 1 times 4. It's minus 4, so silicon must be plus 4, and that becomes the number we put in the name. Next, we have cobalt and oxygen. Cobalt is a metal. Oxygen is a nonmetal, so we're going to have an ionic bond. Cobalt would have 2. Oxygen has 6. Not very good at making X's with a stylus. Okay, so our cobalt's going to lose all of its valence electrons. Our nonmetal is going to gain enough to end up with 8. So oxygen needs to gain 2, meaning it gets a negative 2. Cobalt loses 2, oxygen's gaining 2, so no subscripts. Cobalt oxide. We're going to leave a space because cobalt does have multiple oxidation numbers, and you're just going to use that number from the charge. All right, I'm going to pause this now. Um, I suggest you do the same, do the next few, and then I will start it up again. And that's the end of the practice quiz.